Well, good afternoon. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, I want to first say that uh, I want to really, really <laughs> share my admiration of CAST, a uh, long history here, but as we say, uh, there's many corners to the debate. We're going to have a little fun today getting in all the corners from the, not only the economic and the environmental and the animal well-being, but the, the social and the consumer uh, corners of uh, the debates, but uh, it has to start with science. It has to start with uh, facts, and it has to be grounded in that, and I think uh, the world is starting, not just the United States, but to, to pull out the CAST reports and to look at this as kind of the, the pillar that we got to go to, and this is what I think makes CAST unique, and so it's an honor to, to be part of uh, this organization and this award. Uh, I also want to thank uh, DuPont for, uh, DuPont is probably one of the lead, uh, not just uh, investors and supporters, but I don't think you can look at global food without looking at an innovation coming together and not looking at DuPont. Uh, they touch all aspects on the food side, the plant side, and, uh, and they're, they're centered on science. So it's great to, to have DuPont as the sponsor. Thank you, John. Um, so I want to I start off by saying that this is, this is our story, um, I think, as a, as a food industry. And I think it's our opportunity in the window. It's our window of time. And I just did a little reflecting on my way out. I'm going to tell a little bit about my trip on the way out here. Uh, I did a few things uh, yesterday I want to share in my message. But um, since one year ago when this award was announced, you know, a couple questions in the back of the room is how are we doing? How, how, where, where is this food space? And where is technology's role in the food space? Well, I don't know if we've ever had such a big year. And what I mean by that is first I would say that uh, the need for what we do has never been greater. Uh, food prices globally are at an all-time high. For farmers, that's a good thing. But it represents the need that is coming at us. This next 10 years, which I'll talk about in a minute, this next year, 10 years, will tell our story. I think the story's going to end positively, but this emerging middle class, when you start to look at uh, per hundred weight of, uh, of milk to how much uh, meat costs in a grocery store, or the access of it, and more grocery stores running out, more unrest than we've seen anywhere, probably in any year over the last year to two years, for the need for food. What we do is needed more than ever. Uh, but then you turn around and say, but, you know, we read the headlines, is the battles tough? And I would say, no, I will speak only from my lens. I represent the animal health industry globally as the chairman of IFA, but I also look at uh, our company and say, today I can say, to the one year ago when the announcement was made, there's more technology in the marketplace today than there was a year ago. Now you hear the noise and you'll hear you know, the arguments back and forth, but I can specifically say, especially in the animal space, with the new innovations being approved and with markets opening up and with technologies we may have in North America now going to Asia, globally today we have more access than ever before. And I'll third say, there's more investment today than ever before. I've never seen richer pipelines across our industry, not just ours. Uh, since uh, January, we've made two acquisitions, which I say the capital supports the need. The only reason the capital is coming is because of that. Um, you know, the investment in some of the new breakthroughs, I mean, I'd say DuPont and us, an example is uh, entering the markets like enzymes, uh, genomics, uh, data, analytics. Uh, I, I've never seen, to me, the, the movement that we've seen. So I start from saying what a window of time we're in, and it is substantially better than it was a year ago. And I think you'll see that a little bit. But it's all about, I think, conveying and communicating and being a lot bolder and a lot more courageous and, candidly, talking a lot more to people that aren't in our circles. We've spent too much time communicating with ourselves, and it's critical that we move out of that. And I, I, one of my charges this year and goals that I set was five to seven talks in major arenas that we typically aren't in. So we were at Milken earlier this, this, this week in California. We'll be at the Clinton Initiative here. We've got a few talks internationally. We had one earlier in January in China. I think it's critical that we get to policymakers and innovators and consumer groups to hear this story because we are front page. And so I don't want this award to be about us or the talk about Elanco. My goal today is to, to give you confidence, give you a couple new ideas, and to send you out of here with a, to say, hey, let's, let's make the next year, next year's award winner, to stand here next year and say, we've had another record year. Uh, so that, with that, I'm going I'm to start out. Another 
way to convey and communicate today to this new generation. I have a couple teenage daughters, so I not only have to be on Twitter, but now they say, Dad, you're behind. Twitter's you know, old news uh, for the old men. Uh, is what uses Twitter, so you have to use other things. But something that the next generation and a lot of influencers today, one of the top means of communication today to influencers is TED Talks. So that's something that uh, we're doing uh, later this month, is uh, our first TED Talk that we're doing in Indianapolis. And I'm going to share a couple pieces. And uh, so I'm going to open up with one and uh, to, to start and kind of a communicate in a different way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the hunger inside, meaning everybody's got to find the hunger inside from a leadership perspective, but then expose them of the hunger inside of me is actually hunger itself. And so I, I start out with a story. It goes a little bit like this. Uh, you know, and these are two stories that come together that show the spectrum of the business that we're in. First one is uh, Wilson. Uh, his name was Wilson. Uh, I remember distinctly, many years ago, sitting in this little mud hut in Kenya. And Wilson was a man that sat on a crate in the back of that hut. I walk in. He, he spoke English. But I sat there for about five minutes, and the first thing I realized is all I could kind of remember from that day is his feet because his eyes wouldn't look up. His eyes were down. He sat on a small crate. And he began to explain to me what was going on. And I was there because I was chasing something. In a way, it was a little bit of a embarrassment afterwards, but I kept hearing about this 25,000 people that die every day of hunger, and this is the greatest disease, and I've been speaking on it for six or seven years. I actually said, I'm going to find it. Went to Kenya, went to Kibera, lived in the slums, and all the while I'm there, I'm saying, could somebody show me someone that is struggling with malnutrition? Took me three days. Finally, I get to Wilson in this mud hut. He's sitting on this box, and all they told me is it's about his daughter. I quickly find out as he begins to describe himself is, this is my daughter. There's a white sheet sitting next to him that's kind of a transfixed bedroom for about five feet. And I can see in the shadow on the sheet is actually this, his daughter laying there, 14 years old. And he begins to, with his head down, I never saw his face for the first three or four minutes. And he just went on and one quote that he said that distinctly kind of ripped me apart was, I brought this girl into this world, and then I disappeared, and I did what a father shouldn't do. I wasn't there for her. I didn't feed her. And now her malnourished body, she's got a disease, and she's not going to live. And he went on and on. And his younger daughter that's about six is sitting on another crate up by the door. She won't look at me either. And the conversation went through his feet the whole time. And he just continued on, and, and what just wrecked me was there's probably no worse thing, not hunger, but the shame of a parent not being able to provide for a child is probably one of the worst feelings. And it was too late for him. And I quickly learned right then, I was hunting for hunger and I found shame. I speed the story ahead. Another year later, I go four, not four continents away, four blocks from our headquarters. I'm sitting with another individual, because I had to find the reason why there's all this hunger in urban cities all over America with obese kids. I wanted to see that. So I'm sitting in this community center with this, this mother of this 10-year-old daughter, Teresa. Again, it took me six months after looking through journals to realize we had the whole conversation through her feet. She wouldn't look at me. She kept saying, why are you here? I have nothing to tell you. And through her white Velcro sneakers, she begins to tell me the story about her daughter and how she was frustrated at me because I didn't understand. I didn't understand that she had to take half of her SNAP money to get on a bus to get to a grocery store because she's like one of the two million families that are 10 miles away from a grocery store. She said, most of my food comes from gas stations and convenience stores. But when I do get there, and I told her a little bit about milk and eggs and she was very frustrated with me because she said, affording the outside of the store is not easy. And hunger was a nuisance for her. I just need to feed them to get them to stop complaining. She said that over and over again. And the center of the store is the food I can afford to fill them up. And I kept asking questions and kept probing. 
And I could tell she was getting frustrated. And then, I don't know the question I asked, but something triggered her to break into tears and to look up to me at the first time. And to say, the worst thing you can have as a mother is to see your 10-year-old daughter head down the sidewalk with a backpack on her back, and she's overweight. And then she bluntly and in a raw way said, I'm sorry, but my daughter is skinny in the mind, and she's fat in the body. And I know you, you'll never understand this, but it's wrong. She'll never be able to compete intellectually. And physically, I put her in a state that I never should have. And for the next five minutes, just like Wilson, she began to sh share the shame as a mother, as a parent, and how life was hard and how things changed. And what I saw, again, hunting for the solution of obesity and hunger in urban cities and not being able to access to food, is getting into the faces of people unleashes the hunger inside of us. And I'm going to talk about, I think, there's faces also that bring hope. And I met one last night. But the challenge to me is, we have to personally, if we're going to tell the story, understand the stories. And you can't get wrecked if you don't have some names and stories yourself. But what Wilson to Teresa did for me that's in this new Enough report is to really highlight that there's many faces. We've spent too much time maybe talking about the extreme hunger that most people can't relate to. That's Wilson. There's the, there's the hey, I, I haven't had meat, milk, and eggs. I live on rice and beans. And there's people out there. Yesterday I lived below the line. Some of you may be doing that this week. I don't like living below the line. You live on a dollar fifty a day. And like coffee, like Starbucks coffee, it's not a good thing. It was a bad day for me yesterday. There's a lot of people that are doing that. There's the hunt. There's the people that are looking every day. Where and when is my next meal going to come from? Then you move to the other side, which is becoming a bigger deal, and much more the audiences we're with, like here in Washington, can relate to, is, hey, getting the right calories. Not every calorie is the same. Our argument is meat, milk, and eggs, and what protein can do to you, and I'll show in just a minute, is significantly different. You can't exchange one calorie for the other. And the other is the edge. These are the people that are 30% of our first world is living one paycheck, two paychecks from being in trouble and being in the food bank. And the other is the tradition. I spend a lot of time in Europe talking about the tradition of food. The point is, the spectrum is wide. And we have to address this spectrum, I believe, head on. And we have to relate to it and understand that. Realize that 40% of the world gets the wrong nutrition, from malnutrition to obesity. And you can say, how, since this last award was announced, did Eli Lilly, my company, decide to spend over $6.5 billion in this space? It's because they believe the first onset to take on diabetes is through animal health and nutrition. And that this is an opportunity going forward, not just for our shareholders, to probably enrich the lives. It's probably just as strong here as it is with pharmaceuticals, if not better. So I think the spectrum's never been wider. But I think we have to communicate this way to get people to relate to it. We need Wilsons and Teresas to be able to connect to it. And we need to go to Milkins and Clinton Initiatives and TED Talks to broaden our message. We think, you know, the other thing is we have a lot of good readable stuff, and I think we've got to anchor on things like cast reports, but then we've got to take and say, is it a tweet? Is it a TED Talk? Is it a napkin? We've got to be able to make it usable. This last report we did, I had a reporter who spent all day with reporters, and he said, I need more specifics. I said, well, the report wasn't necessarily designed for you, because we have a two-fold. Every time you open it up, I use my 17 and 15-year-old daughters to say they like pictures, they want clips, they want quotes, they want the punchline. And I think we've got to continue to work on making sure our story gets more usable, not just readable. We're scientists, but we've got to make sure we communicate. That's hard. It's hard in our company to do that. <clears throat> we got to move out of the crisis and start moving to the solution. There is a great story here. And I don't think people like to be in the crisis mode as much as this is maybe the, one of the greatest challenges. National Geographic, great article if you haven't read it this month. But I liked it because it's got a positive slant. 2050, we end this thing. We'll be the leaders that help make that happen. It's not hunger as much as food security. It's not the extreme. It's not just conventions, but I think it's personalization. And we got to move from not just a discussion, but a movement. 
Now, what I would say is, I'll throw you out one today that we're, we're doing that's genericized. Anyone can do it. But our goal is, we want, before the end of this year, 10,000 people saying food security is their cause. Not just our employees and families, but customers and as many people to create a movement here. So, these are the, you always got to boil it down, and here's our image. There's three realities to the reporters today on a piece of paper or, you know, to, to anyone is there's a window here. There's a window of time. I call it the next 10 years. We've got it, and, and it's coming at us. I'll show you a few headlines. It's coming at us, and there's, there's a need, so let's fill it right now. But there's not the 7 to 9 billion. There's the 3 billion in middle class, more middle class growth in the next seven years. I was in Africa in January. 22,000 families a day are going into the middle class. Uh, tremendous positive story. But they're, they're wanting better food, and they're wanting more food. And that's why when I stood in a, a farm yesterday and said, well, then why do you have $28 hundredweight milk? And he said, because there's exports. Our milk's going other places. The second is the 60% for our business. The next number is there's going to be FAO says 60% increase in meat, milk, and eggs. But we've got this climate challenge, this planet resource <coughs> challenge to say, hey, in August we run over the line that we've used up all the resources we should use. So we not only do this, and it was said even in the National Geographic, we not just do it the same, you know, more food on same, we do it for less. We have to reverse the footprint, and we can. And I'm going to show you a real life example from late last night on my trip here that I saw to, to, to show the hope of that. So these are to me the realities, but it's in a window to say we had seven to eight years to pull this off. Now, is it really happening? Uh, a real compliment to Cass for, for highlighting, I think, communication and linking it with science is you're darn right it's happening. And, and we need this. And you can go around and we, we do a, what are the headlines? We get it every morning on our computer at 7 a.m. And we send out what the consumer is saying to customers, the people from our team here today, to our customers, not only what they're saying, but what are they saying about the controversial issues. But that, 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 that log is getting longer and longer because we're involved in more and more things, from the obesity challenges to ag prices to food shortages to you know this gap between what is needed versus what we have. I shared with a reporter that, yeah, we do have 14% less milk than we did as short as 20 years ago per person. Reports that that can't be the case. No, no it is. And uh, we, we've got we've to fill that gap. So I think the realities around the world, the headlines, uh, pick up a newspaper and look through the lens of saying, how does this impact the world that we're in of food today? And I would say, you'll probably circle more things than you ever have. So I think that ultimately, you know, this is the, all the areas we can touch, but I, I want to just center in on a couple things in the middle. So how do we solve this? National Geographic had five solutions. I think I would argue that four of their solutions fit into these. It's, it's all about doing it innovatively. 70% of the solutions are on innovation. I want to talk about that. I want to put it in an application here in a minute. The other is choice. I'll show you a little video clip and talk about the consumer. I think the greatest breakthrough in the last year is some things we're learning about the consumer. And I want to share something that's going on behind the curtain in Elanco that gives me more excitement than anything else I've seen in the last year. And then the last is trade. Uh, I think those are the three solutions that say we have a food secure world. Forget about 2050. We'll have this thing in sight by 2022. Okay. No, no question. So let's look at each one. Let's unravel each one. You know, if you've seen FAO, weathers, but the Gates Foundation, every annual letter, the Gates, the Gates letter, uh, you, can, you can cast many others. Look, you can argue the numbers, even National Geographic. The majority of the solution is going to come from innovation. Now, there's a lot of words around this. Is that science? Is that better practices? Is that doing things better than we are today? In the area of practices, genetics, products, that's, that's where the solution has to come. I'm sorry. I think, uh, yeah, there can be innovation around food waste, but I don't think it's food waste. I don't think publicly what I don't agree with in the National Geographic is I don't think it's changing diets or population control or I don't think that is the case. I think it's it's heavily around being more innovative. That's where the solution is. For us too, it's we're provocatively saying even since the world food price, we're being a little bit more provocative to say 
we don't need any more animals. We can get 60% more. And we've got economists and a food gap analysis that we're working on to say, you don't need any more animals. You can do it. And I'm going to show you uh, with a dairy that I was on last night to prove my point. And I'll, I'll, let, me, let me unravel this. Let me, you got to talk in examples. So, you know, an example is some of you have seen this, and we've got a, we've got a pork example we're about ready to roll out, and a beef to, to try to make this more applicable. But, you know, let's just take milk. And I've shared this, and some of you have seen some of this, but uh, we've doubled it in 50 years, but we have 14% less. We need two glasses, but we have one. That's something that, you know, my family or my wife's book club can understand, is this is what we have and this is what we need. And some people say, do we really need it? And we got into some debates today. The top argument with about five reporters today was, do we really even need? Let's just go to a grain diet. And what's when we say not every calorie is the same. And there's lots and lots of studies, and I think we need to do more studies here. This is a study that was done in Kenya. I know of a major meat company in the U.S. who just did one as well. In another place, dietitians are doing studies on this. But when you take and say five semesters of kids in Kenya, and they stay the same, their test scores go down 10%, when they're supplemented with the same calorie equivalent of energy, scores went down 7 when they were given milk in their diet, up 28% on the scores, and 45%. There's new studies now being done. This is cognitive. There's a lot being done right now on physical. How can Teresa afford more the outside of the grocery store? And the impact on obesity, even with animal-based protein, is absolutely critical. And right now the paradox is they're thinking the other way. There's too much beef being eaten. There's too much. And what we've got to do is show this in a better way. The next generation of communication here, the next couple of years, we've got to attack this. Uh, and with good studies and good information in the right way. Uh, so that's why do we need two glasses? Because of this. We, we wrote up uh, an editorial last week and we purposely in the Huffington Post and it was actually sponsored by Chipotle. <laughs> and next to my editorial was Farmed and Dangerous. I actually tweeted that out said okay. we have to go places where we're not necessarily desired. And if you haven't watched Farmed and Dangerous you should because there's other people communicating also in different ways. And we need to be open to what is being said. And uh, that's a four-part series on the Hulu channel. I would encourage you. I watched it with my family. They turned around four minutes in and said, Dad, is that you? Okay. But you got to, you've got to be able to, I think, understand fully what, what, what is happening. But in that, it was no meat for you. And the first paragraph described the whole paradox of people saying, you don't need meat. And then the rest of the editorial, and you can go and look at a copy of it, is starting to unwind a little bit of, no, the power and the importance of meat in a diet. And if you've climbed into the middle class and you're in Indonesia or you're in Des Moines and you're told, sorry, prices are now 30% higher, you can't have it, I don't think that's, that's the right thing. So one cow globally produces about two gallons of milk, 32 glasses, um, and the challenge is to fill the gap going from we have one and need two glasses, we need per cow an improvement every year of about a half a glass of milk per day. Okay, that's what we need. So let me introduce you to a family. On my way out here, I stopped in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Heard about this farm, but we're always asking, hey, tell, tell us about farms, tell us about stories. So this is Neil and Mary Lou King. I, I went and milked cows with them last night. They would say that I got in the way, but I spent three hours with them and got dirty. And What a family. Okay? What an amazing family. Um, 118 cow dairy. That's Neil and Mary Lou are the third generation. And Colton there, the son of the hat on, is fourth generation. Pretty powerful. They have a little system that every 30 years, they step aside, and the next, the next one steps in. And the grandfather was actually not there, but he's, he's alive and on the 118 cows for the last 10 years, okay? Um, they've increased milk production by 16 cups per cow in the last 10 years. They're producing about 10 gallons, while the world's producing two. Okay, small farm, tie stall, 
Some people would argue, my goodness, they're milking only twice a day. All right? So we need, that's, that's right now in that 10-year period, they've gone up one and a half cups. We only need a half a cup. And they're at the top end of the spectrum, are you with me? At 10 gallons. The dairies we're looking at in India that are less than a half a gallon, I think we got our opportunity. We don't need more animals. We need productivity, all animals, and make sure the animals are in the right place in the world. They did all this while decreasing. I don't have all the data I could pull together from last night, but we started calculating how many less gallons of water. They have 200 acres of land. They need about uh, two acres per cow. Everything's sustainable. They put the manure on the land. They produce alfalfa. And then they began to walk me through all the things that they do to keep production going up. Pretty sustainable. I saw it sitting there. I'm like, wow, it's economically sustainable. It's generational and sustainable, environmental. They got their own calf operation. They got their own alfalfa. It all works. And now they think about 25, 20 to 25% of their milk is being exported. Can this be done? I need Mary Lou. And I need Neil. Candidly, personally. This is what makes me say, we go after Teresa and Wilson. You need faces of hope as much as you need faces that fire up your hunger. When I started to say, tell me about your technology, uh, they didn't start with ours. <laughs> I even had to say, hey, this is what we make. Are you using it? Okay. But they walked around and said, hey, these soft, soft rubber beds. And hey, uh, we, we know that they're sick by the feed. And they, 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 they said the best way to detect is, you know, we call a veterinarian if they're, they're, they're coming off feed. But hey, let us come over here. And where they were very advanced and used a lot of advanced technology was genetics. You know, they knew it's all about they sex semen, it's all about calf management, it's all about the dry cow. They knew their areas of greatest opportunity. Uh, reproduction, alfalfa management, tunnel ventilation, and yes, they do use pile technology. And they find a processor that accepts the technologies and they say the FDA approves it, that's gate one. And they walked over the door and said, and here's gate two. We use stuff that works and that is safe. And when the milk truck goes down the aisle, we make sure down the road. It's, it's, it's the best product that anyone would ever want. Folks, Mary Lou and Neil King, on my way out here last night, living on a dollar and a half a day, by the way, was, was my hope to fire me up, coming here to communicate to you to say, this, this can be done. This story is going to have a positive ending. And right here is an example of that. Now, are there challenges that they have and challenges we have? Absolutely. And I want to get into some of that. The alternative. Ah, oh, don't, don't do that. Let's just let cows go and let's just not use technology and let's not use the advancements. 66 million more cows. So we need another seven U.S.'s. Not possible. This week, being very provocative to say and very, very open to say, we're launching a brand new technology in Mexico. That is a new protein platform for a dry cow around mastitis that will be a breakthrough technology, we believe that candidly and openly will allow farmers to use less antibiotics and to get ahead of their biggest disease challenge on a dairy farm. And that will start in Mexico and be in New Zealand later this year and around the world. And we're using that platform as we go forward to see that as a new opportunity for us in this space. So I'm pretty excited. So then we move to the second one, which is, but Jeff, what about this consumer? What about that advertisement next to you and the editorial? So let's, let's look at it. And first is get into it. Understand what they're doing. I'm always wandering around, going into Whole Foods and looking at it. And, and I believe in choice. And there's people here that likely say, hey, I want to eat organic or don't want to eat meat. Or I, I fully think choice is the biggest release valve that we have for anyone. Anyone has the right to choose. And to just give you a sense of what we're dealing with, take a look. This is poor Landy. It's more for me than you. God, you have beautiful eyes. Everyone tells me that. I'm the only one that told you that. No, I don't mean like enough learning. Soy and hazelnuts. Yes, this is, this is local? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to ask you just one more time. It's local. It is. 
Is that USDA organic or Oregon organic or Portland organic? It's just all across the board, organic. <laughs> Hazelnut, is it local? How big is the area where the chickens are able to roam free? I'm sorry to interrupt. I have it exactly the same question. <laughs> Four acres. Give me just a second. I'll be right back. Okay. 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 You're doing the right thing. I'm too hard. You are. I, I drove way too slow here today, didn't I? Mm -hmm. I'm so weird at that gas pedal. I think this moves the whole vehicle forward now. All right. Yes. So here is the chicken you'll be enjoying okay. tonight. You have this information. This is fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, his name was Colin. He <laughs> 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 looks like a happy little yeah. <laughs> <laughs> chicken. This friend putting his little wing around another one and kind of like howling around. I don't know that I can speak to that level of uh, intimate knowledge about him. Um, they do a lot to make sure that their chickens uh, uh, are very happy. When you say they, I mean, who are these people raising Colin? It's a farm that's located about uh, 30 miles south of Portland. And 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 Thank you so much, Dan. Sure. All right, so that is uh, one of the, besides Duck Dynasty and the other extreme, Portlandia is a, 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 a pretty popular show right now for especially the West Coast, but it's uh, just a taste of, I think, some of the, the realities in the consumer circles. So. I want to share what I'm probably most excited about over the last year. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things in our pipeline and acquisitions, but if you had to say, what's the one thing that excites you the most, Jeff? It's, it's probably in this space and what the consumer's saying. Uh, our world's changed, folks, and our world's changed a lot in communications, and I think well, how we communicate, but also how we participate in the conversation is even more critical. So let's, let's take a look at this. First, and we keep updating this study, and candidly, we just keep, and I keep coming back to this. I always keep this slide in here. We updated this in 2013, and we use a lens to say it's absolutely critical when you look at any study, you look at really two key things. Uh, and I'll, I'll build on this a little bit more in a minute, is unaided questions. And I was asked an aided question today about beef, and I turned it around and said, well, <coughs> let me ask you an aided question to the reporter, and I'll force you into a yes or a no. Uh, state propositions force us into a state, uh, you know, a yes or a no. We need to make sure we turn this thing to say what's important to you, consumer, and be ready for the answer. And there are, there is a percentage of the population that may want some things that you can't provide, or we need to adjust and continue to look at. The others, you know, we we just made an acquisition to get into fish because one thing we're learning is this is a protein we can't afford not to be in. As an example, spending data is the other very important to say, hey, you may say something, but you really tell me what you mean when you purchase that. In January, I spoke with the Economist Food Security. I sat with five retailers the night before dinner, and they all told me that their surveys show between 20 and 40 percent demand for organics. Purchases now are between 2 and 4 percent. What they say and what they do in purchasing is somewhere between 5 and 10 X off in the UK right so that's why, to really know what the world is saying about food and technology and food, we've got to look at unaided questions and spend data. Those are the two filters. Everything else, candidly, I usually look at a survey and ask that question. If it's not, then I would be very careful. You're leading your outcome. And what we see at a high level, you know, over and over again, globally, on all the studies, these aren't any land code, these are any that are done, is there's food buyers out there. A good 95% want taste, cost, nutrition. Want something that tastes good, can afford it, nutrition. Then there's the luxury buyers. Now, that may be 100% of segments around here where money is not an issue, um, or it can be a certain item. But then there's the fringe, which is a small percentage, 1% uh, or so, that, hey, I believe this food is personal to all of us, but it becomes so personal to some people it becomes a social movement. And I think that's where we need to separate and say, hey, what is the motive? And if it is choice, your choice, trying to take choice away from everybody else, that's when I think we need to dig in. And some of the, the, the examples that I've shared are, are examples, uh, you know, such as farm and dangerous, is that 
Is there is there a is there a bigger platform there? So 99% want what we can provide, what Mary Lou and Neil can provide. Now here is a slide that I would highlight to say is absolutely critical. And this is what I shared a lot with the reporters today. It's because our world has changed, we can understand what consumers want more. And the dialogue that we're having today with quick service restaurants and retailers has never been greater because of this chart. We need to move away from headlines. Headlines, yeah, they matter. But what really matters is what's the discussion. We can measure the discussion right now more than ever. And I'm going to show you pink slime here in a minute and play that tape back. We can understand the dialogue. If you want to know how many antibiotic and meat mentions were in Washington, D.C. today, we can have it by, you know, within 30 minutes. And we can get that to a major retailer that's curious and interested. And if it is an issue, let's dig in and let's make sure we address it. The other one is aided versus unaided. We've already covered that. And the importance of be careful if it's an aided question. The last one is many retailers five years ago were determining what consumers wanted by call inquiry lines. And activists picked up on that. Moving now much more to consumer spending. My challenge is with the three metrics to the right, consumer spending, unaided questions, and media mentions, we can influence. I believe there's been three pink slimes since the pink slime that haven't happened because the management of the things on the right are happening better than ever. The communicators of the future and technology, if Norman Borlaug was back, I think his focus would be on the right. And it's critical because wrong premature decisions, we cannot afford any more irradiations a good technology that's gone that probably won't be able to come back. So here's an example of a report. This looks at Twitter, looks at everything, newspapers, YouTube, anything that's going on any day, there's technology out there to say, hey, here's the antibiotic mentions uh, over the course of the year, and here's the social cloud. You can provide that to a retailer. Okay? I, didn't, I was going to bring a picture of a new room that we've built in our new headquarters, just opened it two weeks ago. It's got TV screens all over it. It's managed by an outside company. And it actually can manage any topic and issue around meat, milk, and eggs and funnel it to any consumer or any retailer group anywhere around the world. So they can say, tell us about beta agonists, big agriculture, antibiotics, sex semen. We can do that. So they know what the conversation is. And you can start to say, hey, mentions. And, you know, the key thing is if you don't have 5,000 mentions a day for three days, it's probably not an issue. And an example is someone called recently and said, hey, tell us what the average antibiotic mention was. And you can see it was about 140 last year. And we jokingly said the comeback of the Twinkie in 2013 and one day had 40,000. That's how Americans were concerned we were going to lose our Twinkie. And then uh, the U.S. government shut down on October 1 at 814,000. And you can compare it to the hot topics of the day. So here's my pink slime challenge, and that is simply this, to say, as you all recall, when this issue hit, uh, it hit in March. And uh, the Jamie Oliver YouTube clip and the things that started to occur in a very, sh sh you know, very short three, four day period of time. If you back up and had the technology that is in place today to manage the consumer then, you would have seen that in January, actually, there was over 5,000 mentions. And that would have triggered and, and some things that we've put in place and others have put in place, that would have triggered a call the regulatory body. Let's call the major retailers. Let's, let's enact, there's something out here we need to look at. So that when it happened, the surprise effect would have been less and people would have been prepared to respond. If we take the surprise factor out, but the other thing is who's concerned about it, let's get to them. It's not defense, it's offense saying, hey, we need to address this. And I think anyone that brings an innovation to food, needs to have a capability and own this. Because if their innovation pops up, I think they're the key ones and the regulator will be a regular. This is exciting because what I would say is a lot less noise. And today I would say the retailers are seeing what and what is not the consumer issue today more than ever. So this to me is, this is exciting. And this is, I think, opening doors for us in terms of what's the next era of communication as we look at future cast communicators. I think it'll be around understanding what's to the right. Trade, we know this is critical. I don't need to, 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 to emphasize enough, but I think the third solution, innovation, enabling choice, and knowing what the consumer wants, but let's not fool ourselves. Food must move like never before. Probably the area that concerns me the most today 
is yes, we've got some great platforms of trade agreements, but there's not just politics in the middle of this. There's also some, what I would say, promoting on the negative. Saying, hey, country X, I can do it for you. <clears throat> because the need for exports is so important to a company. That we need to make sure that we, we ground ourselves <coughs> on science, but we also ensure ourselves to allow countries to understand what they're saying yes and no to. If food can't move, this could prevent issues. In the Enough Report, we highlight how much of your meat drawer is foreign-owned here in the United States as well. Not trying to highlight that as a negative, globalization will occur. But when reverse trade and someone coming back and acquiring companies here starts to then say, hey, we would like you to change your policy to our philosophy, then American agriculture would be threatened by that as well. So, in summary, innovation is 70%. Pipelines are full. There's more technology being used than when they announced this award a year ago. Choice and trade, or choice, consumer choice, I think retail, retailers are as knowledgeable and as connected, I can speak, on the meat, milk, and egg side as ever. Mike Brown, the team's here, that's what he does full time. We've got a large investments area. I would say today that's, um, that, that's uh, you know, never, never in, in full control, but there's awareness there. Now we've got to spread that to wider bodies and more groups. I think trade is our opportunity. Probably provides us the shortest term, probably greatest risk. Those are the three solutions. You know, I end this. I speak to a lot of universities, and I was I was down in Texas here, spoke at a couple of universities, and I, I use this a lot with people to, to get them involved in food, but also to say to be good communicators. I think this is important. There's three important days. Getting a little philosophical with students, kind of wake them up, is to say, uh, hey, there's the day you're born. There's the day you find out why you're born. Uh, we have probably too many people walking around in the food business where we say, in the agriculture business, to say this is not a job. This, this has to be personal. This has to be personal. We have to put Wilsons and Mary Lou's in the center of this. We have to look at faces because then suddenly that hunger wakes up inside of you and says, why I'm doing it. We don't need political correctness. We need courageous people that are willing to be bold and not politically correct because the other side, they're not worried about that. We need to be smart and wise, but I think we need to be as bold as we've ever been. If so, the window's open for us to take advantage of this opportunity. There's people counting on us to do that. There's also a day, whether it's your retirement party or final days of your life or whatever, to whether your judge say, hey, what'd you do? I think we got a 10-year window right now that there's an expectation that we step up and lead as a whole. My encouragement in universities is there's no better place than being agriculture and food and, and technology and speak out on that. So, and it's these, these individuals that, that really open it up to say, these faces are what give me the, the hope and the excitement going forward. Thank you. Thank you to CAST again. And uh, this is our story, our time, and our window of opportunity. And I look forward to working with all of you to, to take advantage of it.